the queen of funk, as she was so eloquently dubbed by funk's godfather, George Clinton, Malia Franklin, contributed so much to the genre that she became a name that slivered its way into the hearts and minds of those who felt the funk, believed in the funk, and most of all, served the highest of callings to the funk. Once her name became known, it spread like wildfire. Her reputation preceded her. Her vocals challenged some and intimidated others. Her soul spoke to the very definition of what the funk stood for, a feeling in music that could only be felt if it was truly known and played as if it had been birthed through the individuals who dared to caress an instrument and allow the melodies to flow. Malia Franklin was one of those conduits. Uh, incredible. Um, it was challenging at times. It was beautiful at times. It was lonely at times. Uh, it was many different things. Uh, when you're a little kid, a little, you know, not even 10, like when you're six or seven years old and you are raised in a very unconventional uh, life. Uh, because I came from grandparents that were politicians and union people and business people. And then my parents were both in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was growing up, it was at a time when par my mother was a member of the biggest black group in the world at that time, which was Parliament Funkadelic. So that was a very um, interesting time as a child. I was negative uh, three <laughs> at that time. I wasn't even born yet. Okay. When my mother met George Clinton, she was 14. Mm -hmm. And this was 1967. Mm -hmm. um, it was right after the Detroit riots of 67. And um, our family and George, who was the leader of the parliament, uh, and his fiance Liz all became really, really tight. And it was at a time when George was just trying to be successful. And uh, so when I say everybody, I mean, of course, Parliament Funkadelic, Boosie's Rubber Band, Earth, Wind and Fire, the Ohio Players, uh, Sly Stone, a band called the ADC Band in Detroit, Enchantment, Graham Central Station. My babysitters were the Ohio Players, you know, or Sly Stone. My mother's first recording contract was offered to her at 13 by Motown. She won a, there was a talent show with, by the biggest radio station in Detroit, WCHB. They had a ta yearly, they had a talent show every year. And my mother won at 13 singing Mary Wells, My Guy. I think her biggest, I think what probably bothered her soul the most, probably until her last day, was that, you know, my mother was of mixed race. She was a, a child of a Caucasian mother and a father that was black and Cuban. And uh, at first glance, she looked, my mother looked Caucasian, very fair skin, uh, uh, you know, slightly wavy hair, uh, small features. Um, and this was at a time when um, you know you think about this as being a time when the the marches for civil rights are going on, you know, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And my mother was black and proud, but her and my aunt Jennifer were 
kind of these rare breed of girls that were not quite black enough for the black folks, but too black for the white folks. She wanted to be, she was excited about being a singer. That's all she wanted to do. That's all she wanted to be. The issue was that she didn't want to be an opera singer. She wanted to be a soul singer. And she had a father who was at that time what we would call bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. which is now called bougie, mm -hmm. but is bourgeoisie is the is the correct term. Mm -hmm. And he was a and, and he was a man that wanted a certain stature of of uh, or he 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 was very particular about his blackness. And what he saw of a lot of black singers, like and from his day, like Billie Holiday and people like that, where either you were going to be a, a lush, you were going to be strung out, you were going to be something like that. So he didn't want that for his daughter. He wanted her to be Leontine Price. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want that. But on the flip side, she had a mother who was white, who was very, um, uh, who was a cheerleader for her being a, black artists and singing popular black music. So uh, it created a look, Parlette created a look, and I'll tell you, uh, my mother and Prince were very good friends. Mm -hmm. And Prince told my mother, he said, Parlette was the first interracial girl group I had ever seen. Parlette came out in 1978, Vanity Six came out in 1982. So, you know, Parlette was, they were, they were, and, you know, they were, for, and Prince, Prince told my mother, he said, he said, I've been a fan of Parlette since the first album. Mm. And that's how they became friends. George Clinton is the one that coined her the Queen of Funk. Mm -hmm. When his first solo album came out on Capitol Computer Games that had Atomic Dog on it. Mm -hmm. The way that he did the back of the uh, the credits of the album is, but on this particular album, he had the girls on one side, and then he had my mother by herself. She had her own little box that said Malia Franklin. And the box connected through George's ear and not the other side of the ear said Queen of Funk. She'd be on the phone, which was her favorite pastime, talking on the phone. Uh, she'd be driving me nuts. And hopefully she would be feeling like she was getting some of her just due. Infamous to the world as she was famous to the inner circle of funk, Malia Franklin made her mark in history. From the introduction of Bootsy Collins and George Clinton to numerous hip-hop acts of yesteryear, her influence will be felt for years to come. But the evidence of her having been here will be seen for untold generations. Malia Franklin, we salute you in all your endeavors. And as long as the funk exists to those of us who remember, you will forever be known as the queen of funk. Yeah.